The first proposition, if you like, is I think we are entering into an era, a new era, what I'd describe, of geopolitical competition. In the last five years in particular, China has changed gears in an important way. It started to rethink its place in the world. It started to, to say, you know what, this is our time now as well. We want to start having much more influence in the way that global affairs are shaped. And the result of that is butting up against the US in all sorts of ways, some of them obvious and some of them surprising. Um, and this will be a, a fundamental challenge to the US that has never really seen before. If you think about the Cold War era, the Soviet Union economy was probably never got to be more than half the size of the American economy. But it's entirely likely, unless China has a real economic accident, that sometime in the next decade or two, it's going to be bigger than the US. And it's perfectly possible in 20, 30 years' time, China could be twice the size of the US. So this is absolutely new territory for the US. It isn't something it's ever seen before. But the second big idea I want to, want to try and um, present to you today is that actually I think it's going to be very hard for China to dislodge the US. The US has really big inbuilt advantages that are sometimes not quite appreciated in this country at the moment. There's a certain um, atmosphere of skepticism and of sometimes even declinism in the US at the moment. But the US has real big advantages that will make it very hard for China to really uh, shift the balance of power, if you like, in its direction. So I like to say I'm, I'm the guy who went to China and came away believing in the United States. That's not a story you probably heard very much in the last decade, but that's uh, not being too glib about it, but that's rather the way I come out at it. And what I tried to do in the book, I mean, these sound like rather weighty, uh, heavy academic topics. What I've tried to do is find stories and people and places that can hopefully bring some of these ideas to life and explain the underlying dynamics in a, in a slightly clearer fashion. So let's go, if I may, to that first idea that China is really changing, for what I'd say, from a, a rule taker to a rule maker. Um, you know, for 30 years, China, after Deng Xiaoping took over, China kept its head down and concentrated on growing its economy and accumulating wealth and just on developing its economy and growing people's living standards. But in the last few years, I think something fundamentally started to change in the, almost in the emotional temperature, if you like, in China. Um, when I was living in Beijing, there were a series of very you know, important events. So the Olympics, Clay was talking about the financial crisis. But one of the real sort of symbolic events for me was in 2009, uh, in October 2009, we had the 60th anniversary of the, people, the Foundation of the People's Republic of China. And they held this very grand, lavish parade in the center of Beijing. And it really was an extraordinary, extraordinary spectacle. Over the course of three or four hours, 200,000 people took part, some of them soldiers, some of them civilians. They filled the entire expanse of Tiananmen Square. Um, and really, in that course of those three hours, you did not see a single foot put wrong. Uh, I'd like to describe it, it was a sort of mixture of North Korean mass choreography with a kind of swagger and self-confidence that you used to get in the old days in the Soviet Union and on the May Day parades. And it was one of those events where you began to just sense this underlying pride that was really coming, coming up much of the fore, and a sense that China was starting to, to rethink how, uh, it, its place in the world. And it's starting to make what I describe as that shift from a country that just wants to get by, that wants to, uh, <clears throat> wants to just develop internally and grow its economy, to, to being a great power, the kind of country that wants to go out and try and shape the world more to its end, to try and uh, mold some of the rules and procedures and norms uh, and, and patterns of behavior so that more that de define Chinese interests. You know, we're so accustomed to using the phrase that of, of a rising China. That's the language we always use to describe about China. And there is a lot more still to come. But in an important way, China has risen as well. It's now reached a kind of scale and a kind of critical mass where it now wants to have much more influence for itself. Uh, there's this very interesting Henry Kissinger quote. He's talking about the United States in the 1890s. Um, and he said, the quote was, no nation has ever experienced such an increase in its power without seeking to translate that into global influence. And I think that's the kind of dynamic you're now seeing in China. That's the kind of one of the historical parallels I would use of the US in the 1890s, the 1900s, the Teddy Roosevelt era, when the US was really coming onto the global stage for the first time and wanted to start exerting influence. Now, two, two reasons why I wouldn't push that analogy too far. Um, first one would be, you know, the US 
to then go and invade Cuba and the Philippines. And I'm not necessarily suggesting that that's what China's up to at the moment. Um, and the other obvious point is that China is a new player in global terms, but in Asia, it's very much as the old power. Um, and that's another important part of the story as well. But I think that's the analogy I'd just like to give in the sense that it is a sort of, we're seeing as a kind of coming of age moment where all of a sudden these pressures are building up and a country wants to start staking its claim. So why is this happening now? Why does this happen in the last few years? Well, it could have happened 10 years ago, might have, might have been delayed for another couple of decades. One very important reason, I think, is the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. It really unleashed something very important within the Chinese psyche. Even since Deng Xiaoping's days, there had always been this argument in China in the background between, if you like, the Chinese hawks and the Chinese doves. The hawks said, when we are in a powerful country, we will need to challenge the US in important ways. We'll need to not necessarily confront them, but to push back against the US. And the dove said, that's not the, in really in China's best interest. The best strategy for China is to insert itself in the global economy that the US has created, to become an actor in that economy. That's the best way that we can pursue our own interests. But that was always an argument that was happening in the background. This was something about the future. This is what we'll do in the future when we become a powerful country. The crisis really brought that to the forefront of, of Chinese political and intellectual life. There was a very profound sense, especially in 2009, 2010, that the US is now in decline. This became a very powerful sentiment within China. And still to this day, even though the US has come back to some extent, it's still very much a strong sentiment in China. And the hawks within the Chinese system essentially said, you know what, this is our time now. This is the moment when we need to start pushing back. This is the moment when we need to start taking the initiative. And that set up a whole series of chain, reaction, chain reactions, I think, within the Chinese system. Second thing is just a, it's, a, it's a matter of size. Uh, China has in, increased military spending for the last two decades by about 10% every year, or sometimes more than 10%. If you do that for two decades, you end up with a, quite a substantial military. And China now has the kind of scale, the kind of critical mass where it can start to think that it might try and shape and influence events. So in some reason, China is being more ambitious, being more aggressive in its foreign policy for the simple reason that it can. Then I think you also have to think about the different interests that China has developed over the last 20, 30 years. Um, if you think about the Chinese economy, it now runs on, it depends on iron ore from Brazil, it depends on oil from the Sudan, it depends on coal from Indonesia, um, it depends on copper from the Congo. It has developed all these vast array of, of interests around the world that it needs to start thinking about protecting. All of these products come into the Chinese economy, most of them by sea. And so that's well, the other reason why it started to think very much about economic security of sea lanes. And that's underlying pressure that's building it to build this, the navy that it's built up. And then finally, I'd say you have um, very powerful pressures from within, from below in the system. Uh, you've seen, particularly over the last few years, a strong development of a, a very uh, sometimes aggressive kind of nationalism within China. A lot of it based on the internet. Um, some of it, to some extent, actually fostered by the Communist Party, who after the Tiananmen massacre did actually try and push a very, <coughs> very sort of aggressive kind of nationalism through the education system. And so you've seen, this, uh, you've seen a whole series of, of very emotional outbursts, nationalistic outbursts that have taken place over the last few years. Very anti-Japanese, but also quite skeptical about the US. And sometimes there is now this sense in China that you do feel that occasionally emotion is taking a bigger role in the way that China is behaving overseas. And sometimes it's, it's a little bit less about a long-term calculation of national interest, a little bit more about a kind of emotional response to these events. So all these things together have built up to create this pressure for China to start exerting more influence abroad. The result of this is, I think, that China is now competing much more with the US. The world has been shaped since the end of the Second War, World War has really been dominated by institutions that America created, by American values, and by American money. And China, in all sorts of ways, is now starting to challenge that. It's starting to say that we want to have our say. Uh, it's starting to channel its inner great power. And the three obvious areas I'd just quickly point your attention to where this, I think this is happening. The first is this whole issue of the Navy that China's built up and, uh, and, the, whole, and the way that it's trying to exert more influence in the Western Pacific. 
and we've all you know, read constantly about all these slightly obscure disputes over small islands in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, and they all seem a little bit arcane and a little bit peculiar. But the underlying pattern here is a very slow, deliberate strategy by China to incrementally increase its influence over these maritime areas, over the South China Sea, over the East China Sea. And the process, it hopes to do two different things. It hopes to slowly ease the US Navy out of the region. It's, this is not a strategy about, based on attacking the US in any shape or form. It's about slowly and surely introducing uncertainty into the minds of American commanders and making them just slowly pull back ever further out, out to sea, feeling that they're no longer comfortable operating in those areas. And if that happens, then China hopes that the, the alliances that the US has in Asia will start to fray with South Korea, with Japan, with the Philippines. Those countries would no longer feel quite so secure about the guarantees that the US has offered them, the security guarantees they have from the US. And they might think that they need to pay more attention to what China wants. From this kind of position, if China was able to actually succeed in this long-term strategy, you, it, the I, underlying idea would be that it would start to have much more influence, particularly over economic rules in the region, over trade and commerce, but also potentially over political issues as well. The second area, uh, which is very interesting, that's really transpired in the last few years, is about the Chinese currency, the way they're trying to transform the renminbi into a potential challenger to the US dollar. Uh, in Hong Kong at the moment, there are a whole range of different interesting experiments where they're trying to find ways to allow foreigners to trade in renminbi, to invest in renminbi, to have bank accounts in renminbi. And this is very good business, it's good economics for China, it's, it, it will be very, hel very helpful for Chinese companies. But there's also very much an underlying political motivation as well, which is again to slowly chip away the dominant position that the US dollar has enjoyed. And that exorbitant privilege that that's given American policy, which Chinese policymakers are, have, are, are, are very unhappy about and uncomfortable with. And they like to find a way to slowly try and rein in that kind of power that the US enjoys. And then finally, uh, draw attention to the whole issue of soft power, which has just become an obsession in China in the last decade or so. Uh, there are university courses about soft power. There are museums about uh, tr trying to generate soft power. Uh, one of Xi Jinping's closest policy foreign policy advisors was an academic who made his name, became famous by being the Chinese academic who lionized the idea of soft power. It's very, very much a kind of fast track up through the system. And one of the ways that this is happening is through very big investments in media companies that China is making, trying to take its TV channels, its newspapers, its radio stations overseas to some extent. Um, and just as a, an anecdote, just to show you the extent of the ambition, I mean, China's spending billions of dollars on this, but just to give you an idea of the, the extent of the ambition that China now has, if you go to Times Square in New York City, and you'll all know these very famous neon adverts that they have there, uh, the most famous one's at 47 and Broadway, and there are three different products that are advertised there now in 47 and Broadway, if you go there now. It's Coca-Cola, the most famous brand in the world, Samsung, the most popular mobile phone in the world, and the Xinhua News Agency. That's a, just buying ad space in Times Square doesn't necessarily change anything, but it does tell you about the sense of ambition that, that the Chinese have for these organizations. They have serious plans for them. And just the, the final point I want to make about this, uh, on, on this particular issue is, um, you know, Clay was talking a lot about the idea of contest. And I use the, the, the title contest of the, of the century is very deliberate. This is not a cold war in any shape or form. This is not a return to that kind of all out struggle, a sort of do or death struggle, whereby one country wins because the other country's system collapses. It's absolutely not that kind of dynamic. This is a return to a much older type of dynamic where great powers compete for influence and, influence and power around the world. This is what big, important countries do. They kind of prod and push and jostle and nudge. And unfortunately, sometimes they do fight as well. But this is, should not come as a surprise. This is not a scare story about red China. This is what China would, this is an entirely natural thing for a big, important country like China to think about doing. So I, I use the word contest, I'm thinking much more about it's a chessboard rather than some sort of struggle. Okay. So then we have the second major proposition I'm trying to make that actually China's going to have a hard time uh, at dislodging the US. 
Let me talk a little bit about Asia first, and then I'll talk a bit about soft power, and then we can get on to some questions. The first thing to think about Asia is this. China is not the only country that, that is rising in Asia. In fact, it's surrounded by a whole series of very dynamic and ambitious countries, from South Korea, um, Vietnam has been growing very quickly, Indonesia is, has another success story, and then you have India, the other one billion person country in Asia that also thinks that this is its century. That means, that, that particular dynamic means it's much harder for China to, to dominate the region. It's not rising on its own, it's surrounded by all these other very dynamic important countries that also want to have their say, that also think they want to stake their own claim in the world. And the second point is the, the very strong opposition that China has managed to generate throughout the region to itself in the last five years, precisely during this period when it's trying to, been trying to adopt a more ambitious and more aggressive foreign policy. So I'd like to say it's not the pivot, it's the backlash. Right? In this country, we, we talk so much about the Obama administration's policies towards Asia. We think that so much of it focuses on what the US administration is doing. But the really important thing that has happened in the last five years is the very powerful backlash that China has managed to generate from lots of different countries around the region who very much want to trade with China, they want to do business with China, they see the dynamism of the Chinese economy as a big part of their future, but they don't want to be dominated by China, they don't want to be pushed around by China, they don't want to be bullied by China. And so what has been happening in the last few years is not that the US has been trying to reimpose itself in the region. On the contrary, what's been happening is these countries have been calling out to the US, they've been <coughs> demanding the US to try and get more involved, to give them some backup, to provide them some kind of security and support to prevent them from the fear that they might be pushed around by a stronger China. Uh, and I think um, if you think about it from Chinese terms, it seems to me there are two ways in which they might think about trying to become more influential in Asia and to squeeze out the US. One way would be to show to their neighbors that there's nothing for them to fear. You don't need an alliance with the US because there is no reason for you to fear us. This is precisely what China did from 1997 after the Asian financial crisis to 2008, sometimes called the charm offensive. And it was an incredibly effective strategy. China was, uh, made great gains in Asia. It, it, it developed very strong relationships with lots of different countries around the region. And in, at, if we'd been having this conversation in 2005, there are lots of people who have said that the US's days in Asia were numbered. It was slowly being squeezed out. Since 2008, it's adopted this different strategy of, of trying to throw its weight around a bit more, trying to you know, use some of this military force to settle some of these territorial disputes and to exert more influence over its neighbors. The result has been a very powerful counter reaction where these countries are now calling on the US to get more involved. They're now much closer to the US and they're also talking a lot more between themselves in all sorts of ways to try and counterbalance China. So in a real sense, you know, China had a big opportunity, I think, in, in the last decade to, to drive a wedge uh, between countries like Japan and South Korea to actually try and, um, been, to try and build up a constituency within their politics that would slowly but surely undermine the alliance they have with the US, but they've lost that with the much more aggressive tactics that they've been developing. And then if I may talk a little bit more about soft power. Um, as I mentioned, it's become a, a huge sort of issue within the Chinese political system absolutely top level attention for the really last five years. And the biggest, the biggest, th th this whole process really started with the Beijing Olympics and with that lavish, wonderful opening ceremony that the, the Communist Party put on for the Beijing Olympics. Until last week, that was the most expensive Olympics that had ever been. <laughs> Vladimir Putin had some other ideas, but, uh, but that was a, you know, for all of us who saw it, it was an extraordinary spectacle that they put on. And there was very much underlying idea behind it was to try and use that spectacle as one way to shape and change the way that people think about the country. There was a great quote from the, the man who was the deputy director of the Olympics opening ceremony who said on the day before, he said, we want people to love China, we want people to desire China. That was that's very much the underlying thinking and that's the underlying thinking behind the, the soft power push. They hope that by... Uh, investing so much money in this, they'll find a way to slowly mold the way that people think about China, to give, China, to give Chinese civilization a stronger kind of sense of purchase and power in the world, and as a result, slowly give them a, a kind of influence over the, the way that other countries think. 
And as I mentioned before, one of the main things that vehicles that have chosen to try and do this is through these media companies. Uh, it's through CCTV, which now has a, a Chinese cable news, uh, now has an English language cable news channel here in the US. They've invested a lot in radio stations in the US and around the world. Uh, China Daily is now much more prominent, and it's, it's oftentimes in hotels and in Europe and sometimes in the US it can be the only newspaper you get. And that's potentially a very important issue. I mean, if you were to take uh, some key events in world history in the last couple of decades, you would think of the, the war in Bosnia and the, the bombardment of Sarajevo or the protests in Tahrir Square and the way that CNN and BBC played hugely important influences in the way that those events were reported and understood. If it had been Chinese media who had been the, the dominant international media organization there, that the way that those events would be understood and reacted to might have been quite different. You would have that, so, so there's something quite important going on here that's worth looking into. But I think those Chinese media groups are going to have a really hard time. They're going to really struggle. And one way to explain that is to, to look at the actual success story that new media organizations have had, which is Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera, the Qatar-based channel, um, has become hugely successful in the last decade. And it's become the model for, for China and some other countries who think that there is now a market for what people sometimes call non-Western news. But if you look at the way that Al Jazeera uh, uh, developed, you see why it's going to be very hard for the, for the, for the Chinese, for CCTV. Uh, Al Jazeera became successful because it was able to report stories that Western news organizations couldn't get to within their own backyard. So it first came to prominence during the Iraq war, when it got so violent in places like Fallujah. Uh, Western journalists just couldn't go there anymore. Al Jazeera was there on the ground providing the story that everyone wanted, but the, the more traditional news organizations couldn't provide. Same thing in the Arab Spring when that burst out. Al Jazeera really appointed itself as the voice of the street. Um, it was there on the ground telling all these incredible stories about this protest movement that was breaking out across the Arab world. Again, another huge story that it was able to use to increase its international influence and increase its audience. And that the basic story was that a new channel like this can gain an audience if it tells you the stories in its own backyard that everyone wants to know, but uh, the existing media or organizations can't tell you. That's precisely the thing that these Chinese media groups cannot provide. So you had a case like in the last couple of years, you had the Bo Xi Lai scandal. Hugely interesting and important. It was great news because there was all this crazy stuff going on. There was dead English businessmen in hotels and all sorts of intrigue and this kind of Lady Macbeth character who was his wife. It was a fantastically gripping story, but also it was a hugely important story because all of a sudden we were getting a look inside top level Chinese politics for the first time. It was all of a sudden we were getting a peek inside the, the black box. There was a huge interest around the world uh, and a huge opportunity for any organization that could really have told us the inside story of what was going on in the Bo Xi Lai case. But that's exactly the story that CCTV cannot really bring to us. That's a, the, the, just for the nature of Chinese censorship, that's just impossible for them to really report in that story. That's the possible opportunity for them, but it's also the one thing they can't really give us. And then more broadly, China's ability to exert cultural power is very much inhibited by, the way, by its own political system, by the way it represses some of the more awkward members of Chinese society. Uh, you know, the kind of Ai Weiwei's of this world, or Liu Xiaobo, the Nobel Prize winner. But even in the more favored artists, if you think of someone like Zhang Yimou, the film director, who had a very big audience in this country, particularly with films in the 80s and, and 90s. And he's kind of like a court artist these days. He is the Communist Party's favorite artist. He was the guy who was brought in to be the creative director for the Olympics opening ceremony. And then 2009, when they had the 60th anniversary celebrations, he was also brought in to do another, celebrate, another big performance that day as well in Tiananmen Square. He's the, the most favored artist, if you like, for the, for the regime. I once had an interview with him, and I asked him why it was that all his films were about were historical pieces. Why were they period dramas from the past? Why didn't he make films about contemporary Chinese society? Because as all the Chinese people here in the audience will know, um, below the surface of the more rigid political system in China, the society is exploding in all sorts of directions. It's an incredibly dynamic, complicated, subtle, nuanced, interesting place. A very talented film director like Zhang Yimou with films about modern Chinese society, with precisely the kind of thing that could start to change the way people might think about a society, to make you think about it in a more interesting and subtle ways. 
So I asked them, why is it that you, you don't do any films about modern Chinese society? And I said, it's pretty straightforward. If I did that, I would have the censors in my face every day. It just wouldn't be worth my trouble, so I don't bother. Even the kind of court artist is, feels you can't really do the kind of work that might actually be very useful to China. So in a sense, it's fighting, if there is a, a cultural battle, if you like, China's fighting it with one arm behind its back. So finally, um, just before I open up to questions, just say a couple of final things, if I may, uh, just about for the US. Because um, I don't want to give the impression that everything's very easy for the US and it's going to be pretty straightforward. It is facing this colossal, almost existential challenge. A couple of final messages of how the US will need to respond. Um, obvious one, I think, is about focus. It's about disciplined focus from the administration. That's the whole point about the pivot, is to give a sense of staying power. It's to give the sense that the US is not, is not leaving Asia, it's not pulling back, that it sees its long-term future is very much engaged and completely involved in Asia. Uh, that was very successful a couple of years ago, but even just with one year, the administration's already kind of dropped the ball a bit on that. So you have the Secretary of State, John Kerry, who's completely focused on the Middle East well, for all sorts of good reasons, but his agenda is about Iran, it's about Syria, it's about the peace process. And you had the president last year was supposed to go to Asia, but then he had to cancel because of the, the government shutdown and the debt ceiling crisis. This sends a very, very bad message around the region. It makes it seem as if the US has already become distracted. Two years after it announced this huge, ambitious initiative for Asia, it's already moved on to other things. And the Chinese have been, fr quite frankly, been going around the region saying, you can't rely on the Americans. They've, you know, they've lost interest in you already. They've moved on to something else. The US is going to have to be much more clear and disciplined about focusing on what it really sees as interests. And the final thing, I think, which is actually one of the hardest things, is the US is going to have to find a way to tell a story to itself and to the region about its economic future and how its economic future is tied up in Asia's prosperity. Uh, every politician in this country agrees that the, the secret to really reviving the economy is about manufacturing, it's about exports, it's about um, improving middle class salaries. It's impossible to do that without the US being much more present in the big, fast, fast growing dynamic markets in Asia. Asia is the key to any uh, to, to actually making that strategy viable in any real substantial way. But to tell that story is incredibly hard in the US at the moment because there's so much pessimism about globalization because salaries have been stagnant for two decades. A lot of people in this country think that actually trade has been bad for the US. Um, so you had a situation like in the last presidential election, Mitt Romney and Barack Obama were running around Ohio talking about Chinese cheaters. That obviously plays very badly in China, but it plays very badly across Asia as well where countries look at that and they think, this is, an, this is America that's drawing in on itself. That's no longer really interested in engaging the global economy. The US is going to have to find a way, a series of policies, but also a series of stories to tell that will change that, will change that dynamic. Because ultimately, the US can't just be a country with a few aircraft carriers that intervene whenever something gets wrong. It's going to have to have a much more broader story to tell about its future in Asia.